Hello, I'm Bronwyn Williams, and we're back with The Small Print. And today, my guest is Wandile Silobo. He is the author of a book called Finding Common Ground, but I don't want to take his introduction from him. On this show, we always ask our guests to introduce themselves the way they would like to be introduced. So, Wandile, can you please introduce yourself for us? Yeah, thanks, uh, Bronwyn, for having me on. Um, my name is Wandile Silobo. I am an agricultural economist currently working for the Agricultural Business Chamber of South Africa and also uh, various uh, posts within government. Fantastic. So we invited you on the show because of this book that you put out, Finding Common Ground, which is quite an interesting contribution to the conversation around property rights in South Africa, which is obviously a very contentious issue. Previous guests on the show have included Franz Cronier, who talked about the dangers of diminishing property rights in an economy that's looking to grow. And I think that you have some sympathy with those views, but you also have some of your own ideas. And I thought that some of your ideas are, are quite fresh and quite new, and they also somewhat counterintuitive. So maybe you can just start off with by saying what your intention was with the book that you put out and what you hoped to achieve with it. Yeah, uh, uh, thanks, Brian. I mean, the, the, the process of writing the book was not purely uh, looking at, uh, on, on, on the land, but rather more on an agricultural economic perspective. Because, I mean, I think for one to understand why I wrote it, you have to read the first few, uh, the first chapter, actually, really, where I go on on this monologue of why did I study agricultural economies? Why did I start uh, writing what I do? And the, the, this, the, the key point there or the key takeaway message was the fact that there wasn't a lot of agricultural economic information that is out there accessible in the public. And I, my intention then with the book was to say, how do we begin to provide that sort of material that one would like to read to be out there? And obviously, we're not just having these agricultural economic um, insights for fun, but rather it's a recognition that agriculture in a country like South Africa could play a key role in driving uh, the economic activity, jobs, and all of those things. But then in the process, you come back to the issue of land. And some of the views then that Franz Cornier and the others have expressed, they become then part of the conversation uh, when it comes to that particular point. Yeah, exactly. And it's so timely because I think people are starting to realize once again that all wealth really is derived from the real world. And quite a lot of that real world is reflected in the land, whatever that is. So whether we're talking about things like food security or whether we're talking about even just sort of securing loans, the real economy is where the real challenges lie. And I think it's something that a lot of people have forgotten because it's been so exciting with our wonderful financialized, virtualized economies when you can trade NFTs and become a millionaire overnight. It's very easy to forget about how important the real economy is. And the last few weeks and months have reminded us of that very strongly as we've started to see real resource prices increasing almost everywhere. And most concerning there would be the price increases coming from things like food, which is not an optional extra. You know, this is not a, a tradable virtual commodity that you can do without. This is something that we all need to survive. So food security is critically important, but also, as you said, the land and agriculture is a huge source of potential jobs for an economy like South Africa, which is struggling with massive unemployment. So we should start there because I thought some of your ideas that came through in the book were quite interesting. When we think about agriculture, we think about massive sugar plantations or about corn or maize, but we don't really think about how that translates to the labor market and your ideas around actually looking at horticulture and smaller crops that require more labor intensivity are thought very, very interesting. So maybe you want to just explain your ideas there a little bit more. Yeah, thanks, uh, uh, Brandon. I mean, I, I began, I, mean, I would say, in fact, 50% of the book, as you saw it uh, while reading it, is around the issues of land. Um, and obviously, this was taking land in a contemporary way at which it was discussed in South Africa during the period of writing up of the book, which is covering, I would say, roughly from the late 2015 going into 2020. And in that period, obviously, we were having uh, to fight with two things in South Africa, because you still have a big question about restorative justice. Uh, black people are not heavily involved in, on a, uh, in, in agricultural activity and the other uh, sectors of the economy, and obviously our history of land reform as a country. And the second point is on the one uh, point that you, 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 you close up with around the economic uh, uh, issues in the country. So how do you balance these twin objectives 
of growing while addressing the restorative justice question, which is why I then dedicated a large part of the book on that to say, look, we do need land reform. We need to go forward, but we cannot look at it in a blanket way of saying, let's expropriate land uh, without compensation because as you rightly said, over time, the South African economy is no longer what we used to look at um, in the early 20s or so. It's more financialized now. We are linked in the global market. And also just by nature, South Africa's agricultural sector is labor intensive. So there were all of those things. And then it, it's capital intensive, I mean. And then if it's capital intensive, it means then that you need um, th that investment. So there were all of those things that you needed to balance um, in the equation, which is why then in the book, we decided to say, look, instead of going with expropriation without compensation, there are all of these models of land reform that you can explore. You can establish land reform fund. The government can begin releasing some of the land that it currently owns. There are land donations, um, uh, methods that we, we can come up with. And and this land reform fund, which could set up, could be buying some land in the market and saying, government, consider these options instead of going on this blanket route. But at the same time, then saying, how do we utilize uh, agriculture to bring in those South Africans that were not fortunate enough to get the university degree or higher education so that they can enter in the labor market so that over time they begin to progress into more high skilled uh, places, either in the value chain, food value chain or whatever value chain that is interlinked to the agricultural sector. And that brings in to that question about the hot culture because it is high value but also it is very labor intensive. And we do have areas where we still have underutilized tracts of land and the climate conditions are conducive. And we're saying these are some of the areas that government can pretty much uh, pursue in with its policies. Yeah, so I think that's a quite a good overview of a lot of the issues that you covered. Maybe we should just unpack those a little bit more and to go into detail so we can sort of look at the various different components here. There's essentially two questions that you're looking at in your book here. and, the, and it, two questions that relate to any issues regarding land issues across the world. The one is who gets to benefit from the land, and that speaks to the ownership question and the redistribution question, but it's also the question of value creation. How do we make sure that we're getting the most value out of the scarce resources that we have so we can actually have a multiplier effect there? And various governments across various different places and spaces and across various different times have tried various different strategies that tend to focus on one or the other of those issues, but really what we have to do is look at them at the same time. There's no point in having redistribution and equitable ownership if we are destroying value, because that doesn't really help people at a material, you know, actual level to survive or to improve their living standards. But also, if you look at it the other way around, there's no point in having value creation that is very, very unequal, because that's also not sustainable. So you have some ideas of how you can sort of marry those two concerns in a more sustainable way, sustainable looking out as social sustainability, as well as from hopefully an environmental sustainability perspective too. But I wanted to unpack those ideas a little bit so we can zoom in on some of the, the, the points that you made that I think were, were quite interesting. And the one yeah. you touched on just now was talking about how you actually transfer ownership from people that currently control land and resources towards who can benefit from it. And the one idea that I thought that was quite unusual that you spoke about was quite a lot of people are saying we need to give individual citizens more title deeds. So they have ownership over their own land. So speaking generally to people who live in parts of the, the world, such as like, you know, rural communities that are under tribal control, we need to give individuals title deeds so that they can actually capitalize on their own land and get into the financialized economy. And you spoke up against that idea, saying that it could actually cause more harm than good. And that although you defend property rights in general, you're saying that individual property rights might not solve South Africa's current problems. And this is quite a different view to quite a lot of other people who are going on massive drives to go and try to get title deeds into individuals' hands in South Africa. Would you mind speaking to that point and what your thinking is there and some of the issues that you see coming ahead? Yeah, yeah, you, you've raised a number of, of, of points there, Brian. You, you, you will take me back and forth uh, as we proceed, but I'm going to begin with the, with the first one, which is just around to say uh, uh, who should benefit on, on land reform in South Africa. And as, as your listeners will know, I mean, in South Africa, we are dealing with land reform in about three pillars. 
you have a pillar that is about restitution to say if a particular black South African family owned a certain piece of land or was repossessed by white South Africans, then you have evidence on that. You can go back and do the claims on that. That's the restitution. And then you have a tenure uh, reform, which basically looks at to say if a family lives in a certain piece of land, but they don't have title deeds onto that, the state should assist them in order to get title deeds or some form of formal rights on that piece of land. And then the last pillar is around about redistribution to say, how do we utilize the state muscle to buy land from the market, which is what has been happening since 1994 up until to today, and then transfer bits of that land um, to black South Africans. And the discussion that got heated over the recent past was around that third pillar, because expropriation is not the overarching theme, but rather squarely one of the instruments under the redistribution angle. Now, to one of your questions you are asking, who gets to decide on who benefits on the land, even amongst Black South Africans? And that's where there's been a lot of, you know, um, a, a gray area in, especially on a redistribution, because now there was no clear criteria on to say who then amongst Black South Africans get to benefit. And we've seen literature coming out and some studies of people like uh, Ruth Hall, uh, Tembega Kepe, and, and the others saying, look, the people who gets to benefit a lot are those that tend to be politically linked and also black men that are wealthy relative to black women. So there were all of those issues. And then in the book, we came up with what we call a beneficiary selection criteria, which we write about to say, how does the state gets to decide on who benefits? And obviously in mind, you have to also consider the land. That is, is the land for agriculture? Is it land for housing? If it's for agriculture or, or industrial use, do the people that get selected have those skills and have those capabilities of a particular age? And they have a certain resources to get that land going. Will those resources come from the state or who's going to offer those post resources so that we do land reform with an intention of saying we want it to contribute to growth and job creation. So that's one of the puzzle in the book at which we honed in and provided some bit of guidance onto that. And on that broad, I must say, I mean, uh, I'm happy now as we are speaking on this bird on, on, on a session that uh, if you read on the government uh, uh, policies, we succeeded with that policy on actually pushing it through. It is now the law in South Africa. Black women have to get something around about 30, 35% uh, of the land. Young people also have a good chunk they get. People with disabilities in the redistribution side going forward, they will be amongst the major beneficiaries um, onto that particular point. So that's the one uh, point that you, you, you had raised, which we're dealing with. And I guess on the second one, not to make this a long monologue, was around the issue of saying uh, title deeds. Uh, you make a point that some of your previous guests and general South Africans and in the world in general, I mean, DeSando, the economist, uh, a Latin American economist, he talks about this idea of saying property rights will unlock wealth. And at a broad level, that theory is correct. There's enough evidence that speaks to that. And where there's no um, uh, uh, property rights, we've seen uh, evidence that speak to less investment. But the point that I'm raising somewhere in page 62 in the book is around the complexity of the South African society, especially when you begin to talk about black community of South Africa, because we all have these tribes and all of these, uh, 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 these cultures, and there are certain methods that gets to be followed up in a rural area. If you look, for example, in my home province in the Eastern Cape, in the rural areas, we tend to segment it in three ways. We have the fields, which we call Amasimi. That's where everything else that we plant happens. And then we have another part, which, which is the grazing felt, which in this Tosa we call Amasimi. And then we have where we stay, we have our houses, which we call um, Emakaya or Ekaya. And within those areas, you could have title deeds, Emakaya, which is where you have your house and everything, and then you can invest. But the minute you begin talking about the grazing land, where we all graze our cattle, we mix with the neighbors and everybody else. It's not really easy to pretty much segment and say one day less cattle graze here, uh, Sipo's cattle graze in this part. That, if you understand uh, those dynamics of rural South Africa, gets to be tough. And the second point, again, goes to the issue around um, uh, uh, the fields, because uh, you could plant and have this piece of land, but it moves from generation to generation. It moves from one of your brothers to another, but also even neighbors, they tend to be interchanging all of those things. But more than that, there's also the cultural thing where people, those that are in urban areas, they associate certain parts 
um, of, of, of their rural areas uh, with, with some sort of linkages and some cultures and stuff. And there are graveyards and there are all kinds of things. So my view was to say there are a bit of complexities when you're dealing with that. Give title deeds in the housing, but with the minute you deal with the fields and the, and the other things, that, that the dynamics tends to be, to, be, to, to, to be different. And you have not to apply the blanket approach when you deal with those areas. But dealing with the land that the government is buying from people, from, from other folks and is destined for farmers or farming or is destined for industrial use, then they properly apply um, uh, the, the property rights. But communal areas, be very careful about what you do and the cultural dynamics that are there. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense because there is a distinction there between property rights as a principle. That is the certainty that investors have that they can invest in building a house or planting a field and they know what the rules are going to be in the future, which is absolutely essential really for investor confidence and for economic growth, as you have said, and then how those property rights are distributed and what entity holds them. So we tend to think for, with our very sort of westernized logic that property rights should be vested in the individual, but there are many other ways that property rights can be vested. They can be vested in a business, they can be vested in an organization, in a community or in a collective. I think at the point that you make there that given South Africa's current context and how people are living and how people want to live, you could get a lot of the success of the security of property rights, even if that property right was vested at a different level to the individual. There are case studies across the world looking at places like Botswana, which has done very similar things, and even some of the, 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 the Native American reservations in the, in the United States have looked at property rights in a slightly different way there with varying degrees of success. So uh, am I articulating your point correctly there? Is that is that what you're getting at? Yeah, I mean, I mean, because I think one of the key things there, Bron, we have to consider the people's belief um, on, 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 the, on the land. I mean, if you listen to fellow South Africans and you go uh, down in the rural areas, you do get communities where there is a, a view that if you were to give property rights uh, across, maybe some people will lend, lend, will borrow against their houses. And then somehow this, uh, when they fail paying, this will drive communities into destitute, which is why, again, in the earlier point, I had said, look, you couldn't decide to give title deeds maybe uh, for houses and not give them for grazing field. But a point can be made to say, maybe you could give title deeds for houses where people, you could give title deeds, sorry, for fields, where people have to invest money into doing their agricultural activity. Then for their houses where they worry that people might borrow against their houses and leave Black South Africans across the country in, in, into destitute, then apply a certain logic onto that. So I think the government and everybody else, as we are looking at these policies, we need to be sensitive also to the cultural norms of that, particularly for those areas. And I mean, by that, I don't mean all communal land. There is over 2 million uh, hectares of communal land, which could come into agricultural production in South Africa, add value without actually tapering much with some of these uh, social and the cultural dynamics, which I was, exp I was expressing onto that. So we need in, in brief brand a mixed uh, approach when we deal with tenure and land ownership in South Africa. And I guess even if you read the earlier documents of the ANC, the issue of mixed tenure system and a mixed land ownership system, it does come up in their books. And I think we have to have appreciation of that given our complexity of our of our country and the culture uh, that we, we, we have. Uh, thank you for clarifying that. I do just want to ask, because I think a lot of people are curious about this sort of issue, whether those sorts of collective property rights institutions that, that you are proposing, do they benefit everyone or do they benefit the most powerful people in the communities? Are we then just decentralizing inequalities a little bit or are we really solving the problems? So I absolutely hear what you're saying around, and I think your argument's quite strong if people want to read the book, but I want to give you the opportunity to, to sort of speak to, to that point too. Because I know a lot of people that do think along the more free market lines feel that would be quite unfair fair and that the people that are not perhaps at the at the top of the various different local community hierarchies might actually end up not benefiting much from changes in in ownership structures or in property rights if they're not devolved to the individuals yeah i mean i i think each and every community in south africa brown due to your point i mean it has its own dynamics yeah. perhaps one of the things that could be done is to say when you're dealing with a certain village you have to have conversation with that village as the local government um, that is there to say, look, 
um, should we begin to pilot, for example, and say Emasemini, which is the grazing field, where we will apply then the, the individual uh, titles onto that, and then we see how investments uh, are pretty much get unlocked um, into those areas, and then we move as the communities uh, do allow into that. Because I mean, the other reality about South Africa is this, uh, just a short example. You find that there's one uh, uh, household, let's say they have about two or three sons and their two daughters, uh, a family of five. What tends to happen in rural South Africa, particularly in the black communities, those sons, when they grow older, uh, they go to the chief, they get a certain piece of land for free, which they call Inriwa, which is the new site for building their, their houses. Then you have to consider those dynamics to say, as these families grow, how do you deal with that? And I'm not saying that let's not modernize, but let's say let's modernize and think about investment, but also be sensitive to those cultural dynamics. Because what you will realize if you apply a blanket slate approach, it might actually get there and not be compatible or not be acceptable. Because most of us who makes these arguments are people like myself and yourself, economists and the others, and we're making them with good intention. But have we talked enough with the communities to actually understand what do people on the ground feel about some of these things? Or we want to put this. So I think we should be sensitive on that, but at the same time, not leave the potential that is there untapped, the 2 million hectares or so that I was talking about. Because I mean, in areas, again, I'm going to bring it back to my communities and my villages. Some, if you look at the areas that are there, I mean, there hasn't been a lot of economic activities for over the past two decades or so. And we cannot continue with that. There needs to be something, there needs to be some form of investment and it would involve some changes, which again, some will involve the land, but I think that we need to have a much more nuanced uh, approach on, onto that. But to your central question to say the collective ownership of certain land, I mean, we've had tests of this uh, with these community property associations and all of these things, and they tend to breed a lot of conflict. Um, especially if there are diverging views on objectives about what needs to happen with the business or the land, and that leads to failures, uh, which is why I'm always then sympathetic when you say let's farm as a collective. I think we can give individual land on a, on a collective part, but then leave people in their home states, maybe living in their own individual houses that maybe are not as secure. We have to think about uh, uh, the, 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 those dynamics, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's an interesting point. So what, you, what you're really getting at is it comes down to the sort of informed consent of the governed. This is the basic idea of democracy, right? So outsiders coming in and trying to impose solutions that work for us onto other communities that don't actually want those solutions is not necessarily fair or just what you're speaking about. But there is another argument to be made that if you have sort of tribal law within a democracy, you're essentially almost creating a two-tier society where people that live outside of the tribal system have a different set of rights as individuals, as people who live in that tribal system. So I'm not saying that's necessarily a problem if people consent to having double layers of laws that they submit to, the law of the land, the law of South Africa, the nation, but also the law of their local community. If people consent to that, they submit to that willingly, then we should probably let people do that. I suppose the question comes in, as you were speaking earlier about the rights of say young people and women. So how does it work out if women outside of the sort of tribal collective system get access to owning property and owning farming land that so is being bestowed upon them by the government, by the other sort of plans we were talking about, but women within, say, a tribal community don't have those same rights. Maybe they want them, but they don't have a way to get out of that system because the collective around them has a different set of values. I think this is an interesting point. It's not an easy thing to, to get around, but it, it just speaks to the complexity of African society that has had these sort of westernized values imposed upon it. But there's still a lot of issues below that that we need to sort out as a society. Yeah. I don't know if you'd agree yeah, with I mean, that. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I missed to speak over you. I, 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 absolutely, Brian, because if you read even the title of the essay, we say the complexity of communal land in South Africa, that, that that's on that. And again, I will go back to that point of saying um, how do, for example, women, which if you read a lot of literature, it tends to suggest that they tend to have limited rights compared uh, to, 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 to men um, in, 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 his, in, in the African traditions. But I would submit to that point and say, actually, um, when you begin to do case studies across the country, you realize that even that view is not as uniform because there are communities where you find that 
those women that don't get to marry and they stay uh, by themselves and be single parents or not even ever, they actually get to have their own site to build their own household. But within some cultures, even within South Africa, you find that they get to be marginalized. And then now you need to find a way about how do you strike the balance onto that, which is why I think over time you want to have a more modernized way of the land ownership or maybe more recognition of what's happening in the communal land um, of South Africa. Uh, but you cannot overnight with a stroke of a pen and actually change all of these dynamics because you will have some cultural issues and tribal uh, issues that you have across the country. And I think the best way is really to take it by each province and pilot section by section um, in those three segments of land I was talking mm -hmm. about, grazing fields, the house um, and the houses, um, as, as well as the, as, as, as the fields for, for, for plantations and stuff. And then you, you, you pilot and you move, you cross the river by touching the stones. If you really want to get it right, I think that's, that's the method. And I guess Fenborn, the other thing that we need to do also be sensitive about on this, because there's always this notion in South Africa to say, look, if you put title deeds, investments will follow. Um, and some of the rural South, South Africa, it's not always the case that once they are title deeds, the investment will follow, because you still have infrastructure constraints and all of those things. The fact that some village uh, in the middle of Transkei have title deeds, it doesn't necessarily mean money will flock into that village. There needs to be infrastructure that makes it attractive, link it to the bigger cities so that if there's business there, transaction costs are low and all of those things. So there needs to be a comprehensive structure of development, which will make those areas economically attractive. Yeah, exactly. I think it's it really comes to the point that top down solutions made in like a white ivory tower in some corner there and imposed upon individual human beings that have their own ideas and their own value systems, and their own cultures doesn't necessarily work. It's more complicated than that. We have to look at bottom up solutions that are right for the individuals that are actually going to be affected by it. I think it's also interesting to note, though, that a lot of these issues that we've been speaking about today, the issues of tribal law within a democratic system, are now playing out in Western nations, too, with the revival of the company town model. So I don't know how familiar you are with the new legislation coming out of the US, where they are, some states are now giving companies permission to set up company towns where those companies will be able to collect taxes and make laws for their citizens slash consumers slash workers, which was a model that was explored hundreds of years ago. But I think it's quite interesting that these same sort of two tier systems or law systems within law systems, nested systems, are issues that the West is grappling with at the same time that we've been dealing with them for a much longer time. So perhaps there's lessons that the likes of Amazon and Biden could, could look at your work because we've actually explored these, these issues to a greater extent, even if we haven't found perfect solutions yet. Well, that's a point worth making that there's parallels everywhere in human society and that simple solutions are not always as clear cut as they first appear. Yeah, I haven't read up um, on the on the US uh, 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 part, but again, it brings back to, to, your, to, your, to your central point about the complexities when we're dealing about with governance and we're dealing about uh, uh, managing the societies uh, uh, on that, which obviously, as you rightly say, in the African context, with all of these differences that we do have and unite again uh, on as a country, um, we, we, we have all of those complexities right here, our neighbors and the others, and perhaps, you know, studying and seeing what the other country has done successfully as we all develop is always an important thing to do. Yeah, human relationships are human relationships everywhere. We have the same basic needs and drives and complex ideas wherever in the world we are. So it's not a uniquely South African problem, which I think what I was getting at there. But let's pick up a little bit on your collective farming research. Again, in the book, you looked into that. We've spoken about that a bit. And you had, again, quite a balanced view on how collective farming works in practice. So it seemed to me as a reader of the book that there's sort of marginal returns to collective farming as a viable solution in South Africa, that you can have too much collectivism, but also too much individualism. And there's probably a middle ground that we could look at. Do you want to explain your thoughts a little bit more there? Yeah, I think I think uh, 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 Brian, on the on the collective uh, farming stuff, it always introduces in most cases in South Africa some, some difficulties. Um, if you might start well as a community, but when it comes to sharing the fruits of that harvest, 
um, as well as their objective of saying, where should we be taking this farming entity? There tends to be some conflicting interests um, within the South African society, which is why I, I'd always believe that, you know, if the government is now bought, has bought uh, certain land parcels and they are transferring it, you have to select individual beneficiaries on being able to benefit um, on that piece of land to, rather than giving it um, in full uh, ownership to, to, to a number of villages to say they are in charge of that. But also, even in terms of the returns that they actually get a yield on that if it's large communities. Um, you don't get to quite see a notable improvements in living standards um, of those communities in, in most cases, which is the various um, uh, a case that is that we were making on the book onto that. So my, my view is always to say, if you're going on a commercial farming side, try to be as very small group as possible because that could be managed and where possible, really just give individual ownership, especially to those new pieces of land that the state will be, will be dealing with. And then I think that's, that's, that's the, 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 the point that South Africa should really look at. Because at the end of the day, bro, we're looking also at a situation where we say, how do we create a good number of commercial black farmers that will actually be successful. Because as you look at South Africa right now, if you were to look in terms of a numbers perspective, black farmers are still producing less than 10% of the commercial output of all agricultural products that go into the market. That's according to the surveys uh, from the National Agriculture Marketing Council. So you say, how do you then create a new class that will be as competitive and also come in into this commercial production? And I think, to do that, you need to look at what's working in the country at the moment and how do you replicate that across the racial lines in a more successful way using all the land that is available. Yeah, absolutely. I think that there it's so critical to understand that rights, responsibility and risks you know, all have to sort of link together. So risk reward has to be tied together. The people that are putting in the labor, that are doing the work, they're taking on the financial risk are the ones that are going to get the reward out of it. And it's a metaphor that applies to everything across business and across life, but it's very tangible in the case of farming and land because he who sows should hopefully reap the benefits of that crop. And it comes down to a question of those rights, how they distribute it and how that agreement is set up, that everyone that's putting something in is getting something out. And that's why it's so critical to have that bedrock of the rules of the game laid out at the beginning. Whatever those rules are, the rules can be negotiated. They can be nuanced. They can be different for collectives and for individuals, but they have to be known. They have to be fair and they have to be defined so that people can make conscious choices about what their risk and potential reward will be. Otherwise, it's very unfair. Otherwise, we are setting people up to fail. And in your book, you go into that. You had a couple of really interesting case studies of young people who had tried to get involved in farming, but they were roadblocked at various different places, either through finance or by not having rights at the same time that they were being asked to take on risks. Can you maybe speak to that? Because I thought that was so fascinating. I think there was a case study with a gentleman called Bongani in the book, if I get the name right, if I'm remembering correctly. Yes, yes I mean, you, you, you're quite right. And, and I'm sure that you yourself have read uh, these essays that usually come up on mm. the media, news headline, where they say, you know, big headline, let's make agriculture sexy. Uh, young people do not want to farm. And I'm like, wh where are the, all of these things coming from? Because in reality, I mean, there was a nice study done by some 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 economists at Rhodes University about two years or so ago looking into this, really interviewing and going out to various communities to get a sense of where are these perceptions coming from. And the conclusion that they came from was that actually it's against the notion that is widely spread. People, Young people do want to farm and they do, we don't actually need to make agriculture sexy, we just need to make it profitable so that somebody can know that if I'm comparing agriculture with being a lawyer or whatever, I, it can come up on a competitive basis, then I will go with it if it will give me the livelihood. But then when it begins to come with that point, we are all saying young people should get in, but we are not clear about what are the pathways for young people to actually get in. And once they have studied for agriculture, um, uh, what are the resources that are in place or how can they access those resources? Not to say they should have, you know, some absurd 
um, uh, benefits compared to everybody else. But I mean, the, the, there should be clarity about what are the paths to guide them to actually get there. Which is why then I was so delighted when we finally um, got to 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 to, to uh, get the government to take the policy of beneficiary selection criteria on land redistribution. Because what that begins to do now, it tends to say, okay, we will give a certain portion of all land uh, redistribution farms to young people. And when we're selecting those young people, they have to say have a certain know-how and a certain skills. Now, as they train in these agricultural colleges, there is hope that a certain percentage of them could benefit on that land. And then that, I think it will begin to change the face of agriculture and bring in some young people um, uh, within the sector. So that's for the, the, the key point that I was trying to push onto, onto that article. Mm mention a case study i mean that young fellow we, we we spoke with i mean he had gone through all around uh in government trying to get access to the land he knew how to farm but he was facing all of these hindrances uh, all of these hindrances and all of these blockages which were not very clarified and we still went on to make the notion that young people don't want to farm and there were all of the case studies like that and obviously a more comprehensive one which was done by the guys at rhodes university yeah, and then maybe you can just continue on to that point a little bit more, which I thought was quite interesting, is that the way that land redistribution is currently done, if someone is lucky enough to actually become a beneficiary, there seems to be a lag in the time when the rights or all the title deeds are transferred over to that farmer and when they have to take on the financial responsibility, which seems to be like quite a big roadblock because farming is obviously hugely capital intensive, but no one wants to take a risk on someone that doesn't have tenure. But there seems to be this sort of catch 22 situation people find themselves in where you have the right to farm, but you're only going to actually get the rights to the land after you prove that you can make money. But the only way that you can make money is if you get finance. So it turns into this recursive loop and, and sort of very silly cycle. And you had some like, suggestions on how to break it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, you're 100% correct in a sense that that's a mistake that we made as a country when we adopted what we call the proactive land acquisition strategy, which basically meant that then um, you know, all of the P, all of the land that the government would buy, or the state would keep the rights and list this land to to do to to to, 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 to black South Africans. In principle or in conceptualization, I imagine those that were writing the policy, they assumed that the state would have enough resources so that if one dealer gets this piece of land, he would then be followed up with a certain support and get him going for a certain period. And then once he has succeeded, you then the state will consider buying the land. But in reality, as you rightly said, it doesn't always work in, in, in that way. And I mean, we read every day and see these headlines which say government land reform farms are failing. Uh, what are we doing with this land reform? Part of the story that the government land reforms are failing, not that folks don't know how to farm, but folks don't have money. You take a farm that, for example, was capitalized, I don't know, take a number, 20 million rands, and you give it to somebody who doesn't have maybe a even a 20,000 rand on their balance sheet, and you tell them that they should get that farm going, and you don't offer proper support on time, and also the follow-up training on time. Those are some of the things in the book will say, look, let's be practical about this. And that was also then brought, the book was already out, but this was my criticism with the South African government last year, where in October, the minister comes out, um, uh, announces that the state will be giving 700,000 uh, hectares of land, uh, releasing it as part of the economic reconstruction and reform agenda. But then the problem with that, we were giving people with 30 year leases with, that are non-tradable unable to attract capital to that land. And then that also means that we will be again stuck to that cycle where you have this land and you don't really have any money to actually get it to be productive. And I guess it brings us back to the initial points that we made at the start of this conversation to say, let's make sure land reform addresses two things because we have a twin problem of high unemployment and rising poverty. And obviously the third one being the inequality. Then how can agriculture assist us on restorative justice, which talks about the inequality issue, but at the same time, never neglecting the economic uh, 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 challenges, which means that it has land reform on itself, needs to contribute to economic activity, economic growth and job creation. Then to do that, it involves giving the land rights to black South Africans, which the state should be doing with all of this land that it's been buying and actually letting people to have those land rights, letting people to use the land in the best economic position they feel. If they fear that you won't, select the right person who you think they can use that land efficiently. That's the basic thing I think we need to do.
Absolutely. And one of the solutions that you proposed, which was quite interesting, was the land reform bonds and the land reform bank. There was, a, I think, they're two separate sort of entities that feed in together. And the land reform bonds is quite an interesting concept. Can you explain that, how, how you would explain it rather than how I would explain it, which I'll probably get some things wrong? Yeah, I mean, when we came up with that idea, uh, we obviously we were uh, speaking about it at a high level. Uh, we would depend on people like yourself and the others in the financial markets to help us to create the financial instrument. But the, the basic idea is to say, how do we create a land reform fund so that we can have a certain pot of money that could continuously buy the land, have a certain way of selecting the beneficiary. Once the land has been bought, it can be transferred to the people. This entity, at the time of writing the book, I had conceptualized the land bank because it was still in good state at that time. We have all come to know that the land bank has its own difficulties that it's going through at the moment. But you could still have the land reform fund, have it in the IDC or any of the government entities. What this land reform fund will do, there are South Af fellow South Africans who have talked about they would donate money towards stabilizing and making sure that we get the land reform in the right mm -hmm. area. There were mining companies and the others who had talked about donating land. There were churches who talked about how they donate land, how they donate resources on getting the land reforms up. But now you had no institution which actually have a clear rules of the game and how to do its work and how to aggregate these resources. At the same time, government can think of issuing land reform bonds. At the time, I was thinking again, land bank, that it could do that. And then all of those fellow South Africans like yourself and the others with the know-how about how to work on a financial um, services could say, okay, this is madness. You know, we don't know what you're talking about, Wendell. Throw it against the outside. Others could say, hey, you are onto something, Chief. Let's create something that can actually be utilized on that. That was the opening up of that conversation. And again, you know, this also was part of the land reform uh, report, which we have done uh, for President Ramaphosa when he appointed us uh, with 10 members, um, with other nine members to work and assist him in, in this. Uh, unfortunately, cabinet didn't quite approve that idea, but my hope is that, you know, through this conversation that we are having today and the others, uh, people could still see that this is something that could be explored and at least tested um, to say, okay, let's have a menu of, of, of things that can help us uh, solve the land, the land reform problem. So it was coming from that perspective, but obviously the readers can see on the book some of the mm -hmm. things that we laid out about how we think about it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, complicated problems require creative solutions. So we should explore as many avenues as possible and hopefully have many options on the table rather than just one or two. So now we've spoken quite a lot about making sure that land value is distributed into the hands that need it and that deserve it. But there's also the question of making sure that land becomes valuable in the future, that it is uh, becomes competitive on a global scale. And you did speak about that a little bit. I think that this is a challenge that I think is facing many African countries at the moment. We've got lots of land, we've got lots of labor, but how do we turn that into a competitive advantage in our own unique way? What are some of the opportunities that you've identified, now speaking more as an agricultural economist rather than speaking to the land question, which is much more politicized, where are the opportunities for value creation? Where are the proverbial low-hanging fruits that we can take advantage of given our climates and our human and natural resources. Yeah, let me link it with our previous point of the political economy of agriculture and land stuff. Because I think they have brought them in. Everything's the linked. <laughs> <laughs> because the reality is that we, we, we have to, which is why the, the underpinning point is always that have protect the rights of the land, have the title deeds, don't go down the road of expropriation. Um, because at the end of the day, you want to get investments. Once that investment comes through, then you begin to think about all of these long-term crops uh, mm. with, about horticulture, which is labor intensive and it's also high value. And in much of the provinces that actually are top of, of poorest provinces, my home province, the Eastern Cape, uh, KZN and Limpopo, they have nice and favorable climate change or climate conditions for actually making sure that you grow these labor intensive crops. And these, um, Capital intensive, setting on an orchard, for example, it takes a lot of money than actually just planting soybeans. Mm. 
And also the gains when you do this, you get them in eight years, seven years down the road, which actually means that there are high barriers to entry, but you also need protected rights because you will only gain your benefits down the road for nearly uh, nearly decade after planning on that. So those were some of the things, but then the good benefit of that is that they can absorb a lot of people and the demand in the global market for all of these products that can be produced um, is fairly high. Already, South Africa is exporting about half of what we produce in value terms uh, in agriculture, just over $10 billion of, of agricultural products a year. We could push that number better if we bring in underutilized land. The state on its books, it has something around about just under 9 million hectares. Not all of it is agricultural, but if that which is agricultural could be brought on in full production and investments could follow through. And the level of that investment, it doesn't have to depend on the state. You can actually do the PPP approaches. We've seen this being a success in livestock, in field crop uh, production, and to a certain extent, even in horticulture. How do you then learn those PPP approaches and replicate them in certain parts of the country, attract that capital, create the jobs, and even go down in as far as the jobs within the agricultural value chain. Because if you recall, Bron, when we're thinking about the publication of NDP, chapter six talked about million jobs in agriculture. Most of those jobs were within the horticultural space, talking about provided a prerequisite of increased investments in irrigation. But there were also jobs within the agro-processing sector all of these needs that capital investments within the agricultural economy, and they would make a huge impact if we were to succeed in doing that. Absolutely. So to sort of sum up everything that we've been speaking about today, there's essentially two things we need to get right. The first one is to defend the value of our land. And we can do that through clearly defined and upheld property rights, but also through equitable distribution to make sure that that's extended across. But we also need to then extend value by looking at high yield opportunities, opportunities that are going to multiply value rather than destroy value. And that's where we have to start thinking a bit further ahead into the future. But that's probably a good point to end today's conversation. But I do want to give you the opportunity to have the closing word to put across any points that we haven't quite got to or anything that you want to clarify. And also to tell people where to get hold of you if they want to continue this conversation, if they're interested in exploring your ideas around a land reform bond or banks and all the rest of it, or just to get your insights into your other work in the agricultural economic sphere. Yeah, thanks, Bron. It's been good uh, having this uh, almost hour conversation with you. Um, I would say for me, the key thing uh, to, get, to, to really message to leave with your listeners is to say, look, I understand that as nations grow, the role of agriculture and ability to absorb people, you know, become less and less over time. But in South Africa, we are sitting with a situation where we have a large number of fellow South Africans who are not fortunate to be as educated, and agriculture remains one of those sectors that could absorb those people temporarily. And that's the benefit that we could have for over the next decade, while then they upskill to get into some of the other areas. We're not saying agriculturalize South Africa, we're saying use the resources that you have to cater for the type of labor market that you actually have. That's the central point in there. And for those that are coming from a government or they are lawmakers is to say, let's take the land that the state has been buying and really make sure that we transfer it to South Africans rather than buying and the government hoarding land. Let's make sure that it gets in to be used in a more productive way uh, for, for the country. And I mean, I am available to all the socials on Twitter, just my name, Wandi Lesiklobo, um, and uh, email address is the, is the same as Wandi at agbiz.co.za then you can get a hold of me and we can have conversations around these issues and thank you again Bron. Thank you so much for coming to join us and definitely read Wandile's book it's called Finding Common Ground and you can find it almost everywhere in all good bookstores in South Africa there you go <laughs> thank you so much for joining us this was a really interesting conversation and I think it will hopefully raise some points that people maybe haven't thought of around issues of land in South Africa